is quite loaded. So I want to make sure that uh, we make the best of our time. Um, last week, we set a tone uh, and uh, I spoke about the fact that in this class, I'm going to be speaking directly to three groups of people. Uh, group number one are people that uh, will say, I'm not thinking business at all. I'm not thinking anything in that regard. I'm also going to be talking to people. Uh, please help me mute anybody that is giving us a feedback. I'm also uh, going to be talking to people that have started uh, business. And again, I define what business is. Uh, Jesus said, I'm about my father's business. So whether it's ministry, whether it's a not-for-profit, you are into an itinerary ministry, you have a small business out of your kitchen or garage, or you have a medium-sized operation, it is some sort of business that you've started. Even if you are franchising, um, you, you know, doing something virtually, it's all considered business. And so I'm going to be talking in this class also to people that have started uh, what you want to call a startup and uh, wondering whether they started on the right foot or not. And uh, I'm also going to be talking to people that have been around in their business for a while, but thinking, how am I going to scale? How am I going to gain traction? What is the next level for me? And so these are the three groups of people I'm going to be talking to in this class. So let's enjoy. Uh, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, an average of 4 million businesses, like I said last week, are started every year. And this average is based off records over the last five years in the U.S. And as of uh, last year, 23.2 million businesses uh, were identified in the European Union with high insolvency rate. And in America, we call that bankruptcy. When, when companies can no longer sustain themselves, they shut down. And the highest number of these insolvency uh, is seen in places like France, Germany, and the UK. And uh, the numbers are predicted to even increase. Now, in the US, 70% of new businesses survive beyond just two years. 50% uh, of that number survive beyond five years, and 30% of these new businesses are able to survive past 10 years. And 25% uh, of new businesses survive beyond 15 years. So as the days or years goes, most businesses fold up. They don't live that long. And uh, it means there must be something going wrong, uh, because if we are people of the kingdom, we believe that Bible says that a good man will leave an inheritance for his children's children. It means that if we are people of the kingdom, we should be investing in ways that even impacts the college funding of our grandchildren. It means God wants to prosper you and give you wealth that outlives you. That is uh, how God is able to bless his people. A good man living an inheritance for his children's children. And of course, last week, I uh, made very clear the distinction between our job and our work. And of course, uh, drawing those lines, we realize that we go to school for the job we do. But then the work we do, we are born with it. And so if God gave it to us, talking about our work, no man can take it away from us. Unlike our job, we can be fired just like we are hired. But no man can fire you from that which God gave you. Even God wouldn't take it from you. Because the Bible says that God is not a man, neither the son of man, that he will repent or even take away. The Bible says the giftings of God are without repentance. It means what God gives to you, he doesn't take back. The job you are hired to do, it can't be taken away from you. A lot of professionals in America don't even realize that whatever lines or certification you are given, whether you're a doctor, Dr. Cheryl is a pediatrician, uh, medical uh, personnel, uh, there are CPAs, you're a certified public accountant, all these certificates that you are given 
on paper, what we call our accolades are given to us by colleges. But what we don't realize is that when we break the ethics of these institutions, they have legal rights to withdraw those licenses and those certifications from us. It means that those things, even though we work so hard academically for them, we don't own them perpetually. Our ability to hold on to it and use them is uh, pretty much dependent on how we use uh, those things given to us in terms of the certification in accordance to the, uh, the ethics of the institution that gave those certification to us. But God is not like that. He gives to us, and that is why in the kingdom of God today, we could see people doing all kinds of crazy stuff, and the gift is still active because God never takes away what he gives to us. Again, we learned last week that uh, if business encompasses not just what we do in the marketplace, but even in ministry, just as Jesus said, it's important we approach even ministry with the same mindset of business. Of course, Jesus did the same thing. And uh, how do I know that? He had a treasury. He had a finance person. He had people that were in charge of operations. If he had a 5,000 people in attendance, uh, he needed to provide service. Of course, he had a product. He, his product was service. He said, I did not come to be served. I came to serve. So he was into the service area of business. He was serving the needs of community. In fact, you read the book of Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Bible says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good healing all those that were sick and oppressed by the enemy. That was his product. That was his service, to go out there, deliver people, provide mental health to the madman of Gadara, people that were crazy, he healed them. That was like you're going to see a psychiatrist. That was service being provided in the community. And Jesus packaged his product. The reason why I want to use Jesus as a perfect model of business is because many businesses, as we saw from the statistics, do not survive. But I know a man that started his business over 2,000 years ago, and I tell you what, everybody listening to me this morning is either hired, working directly or indirectly for this man's business. It is called the kingdom of God. And after two years, 2,000 years, this business is thriving. And not just thriving, it is increasing. It's still recruiting. It's still hiring. It's still providing daily living for homes and putting food on the table for people that are even fully engaged in this business that was started by a man 2,000 years ago. It means that if we follow his model, unlike Amazon, which is doing great, like Tesla, all these great institutions who are in some way uh, following the model of Jesus without mentioning Jesus, because Jesus gives us a blueprint for doing business. I think about his operations. When he needed to feed 5,000 people that were in attendance, he had people that were in his operational team. They had to go in search of uh, some sort of bread and loaf, I mean loaf and fish, for him to, you know, uh, pray over it and create a miracle for the people. When he needed to come to Jerusalem, he had a whole team that would go ahead of, uh, ahead of him, a research and development team. He gave them clues of what to look out for. He said, when you go, uh, when you approach, uh, this is what you're going to see. Go to this house. This is what you're going to find. He had insight. He had foresight. One of the things that is missing for us is the fact that we might have insight to some degree as the Spirit uh, uh, provides for us. But then most of us do not really take advantage of that. Jesus took advantage of all these things that were available and made sure that his business, the business of the father, was taken care of. Now, what is going on in the economic world, in the marketplace, is no different from what is happening in the church of Jesus Christ. In fact, data analyzed from 34 Protestant denominations and groups found that 4,500 churches closed in 2019. Those numbers are no different from now. And if you're a pastor listening to me, you would agree with me that church hasn't been the same after the pandemic. Churches are barely recovering. A lot of people shut down. They just couldn't get right back on their feet. And uh, in the 2019 statistics, whilst 4,500 churches were closing down, 3,000 new churches were being established. 
What that simply means is that the rate at which churches were shutting down outnumbered 50% of the number of churches that were being started. That's a staggering number. So with that said, it is important for us to pay attention uh, to all the dynamics of business. Uh, I love Jesus's model because um, there are certain key components of the way Jesus did his business that you and I got to learn from. And of course, uh, before Jesus, there were so many great people that did business. Abraham was a successful businessman. Uh, he was in the agricultural um, space. He had a cattle industry in his days. He owned plenty of livestock, hired a lot of headsmen. He had a lot of employees, according to the book of Genesis chapter 13. Abraham business Bible says it grew as he worked with God and he became wealthy. You will find that in the book of Genesis chapter 26. I think about people like Solomon in his days, even though he was a local king, he was internationally recognized. And I tell you what, you cannot just do anything anyhow as a pastor in your ministry and not be concerned about how people perceive you. I think about Jesus. He was concerned about even the public opinion about his ministry. One day he called his leadership and he said, who do people say I am? He wanted a feedback on public opinion about his ministry. And in that same place, he asked, but who do you say I am? It means that he draws a contrast between the opinion of the public your potential customers out there, and of course, your employees. We need to understand that your greatest asset as a business is your employees. And we'll get into that later on because uh, today, uh, ki ki kingdom principles have been adapted by people out there. They are what they call the 80-20 rule, which is a purely kingdom principle that if you focus on the core, the very core of your team, your leadership, the 80% will be taken care of. In that same way, if the people in-house get it right, the customers will get it right. The public opinion will be right. And so it is key we invest in the people that surround us. Spend the most of your time with them. If you're a pastor, you're a business owner, you want to make sure that your immediate team understand what you stand for. They understand the culture. They understand the product, the service. They understand the DNA that we have as a people. So Jesus addresses both. Who do men say I am? And who do you say I am? What is your opinion out there about our church? What is your opinion there about our business? But then you working here in this place, what is your understanding of what we are doing? And those are key questions we need to address. Solomon understood that very well. His men dressed in a certain way. His men knew how to conduct himself. This man in his days owned vessels. I'm talking about not, you know, cruise uh, ships. He owned merchant vessels. And like today, you will see merchant vessels carry, you know, containers and uh, freight and what have you. Even in the U.S. Navy, they have what they call merchant vessels. And these are vessels that carry weaponry, uh, uh, air to sky missiles, all these great weaponry that uh, the army uses. They even have launched missiles from these uh, uh, merchant vessels. And so it's a powerful thing for a king and a nation to own vessels. Solomon in his days owned it. What that simply meant is that he was into international business. He was doing business overseas. Solomon took advantage of the trade routes that ran through his kingdom at a time, which brought him a considerable amount of wealth to the nation. You see that in the book of 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 27. He was a man of the kingdom. I love this because he also formed profitable ventures. And like I said last week, when you're doing business, you got to be strategic. Uh, there would come a time where you would need to enter into partnership. There would come a time where you would be confronted with mergers. And mergers even happen in ministry. Splits happen in ministry. There are so many things that happen even in church. You will see Paul and Barnabas splitting in ministry. You will see people in the early church coming together. 
for the purposes of ministry. So there comes a time where you enter into partnership. And I will tell you what, in the, in the Old Testament, when God was dealing with the children of Israel, who were pretty much into agriculture, in fact, a lot of these principles are hidden in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 8 and 9, where God says that do not sow your land with diverse kinds of seed. He was pretty much teaching them on mixed cropping. And the fact that whatever you intend to do in the area of business, you got to remain focused. Who are you called to? I remember many years ago, I used to belong to a ministry and a ministry taught us that we should dress like professionals when we go out for evangelism. We should put on suits if we have. We should put on a nice dress, pants and shirt and put on a tie and dress like professional. And the pastor said, we are called to impact the elite. The word he used was elite. And he was pretty much talking about those that were educated. I was in an environment that people did not know how to speak English. And so my question was that, why would we go out and only minister the gospel to only people that are educated? Who is going to bring salvation to people that are uneducated? But that was what that ministry was created for. And so there was a need for specialization. Jesus did not preach to everybody. He was called to specific people. Peter did not preach to everybody. He was called to the Jews. You read a book of Acts chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to chapter 12 to 24. The biggest voice you hear is the man Peter. And his biggest call was to the Jews until, of course, in chapter 10, God brings him to the house of Cornelius. And whilst he was preaching in verse 44 of uh, Acts chapter 10, the people that heard him began to receive the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in tongues. And he was frustrated. I remember when even God showed him that, hey, you got to go pray to Cornelius. He says, I got nothing to do with the unclean, the Gentiles, because he saw this sheet coming down and all kinds of unclean animals on it. And God says, you will not call unclean that which I have called clean. But then we also know in the book of Acts uh, from chapter 12, from, from verse 24, all the way to the end, chapter 28, verse 31, enters Paul, who is called predominantly to the Gentiles. And so he focuses on that and begins to minister to the Gentiles. So there is nothing wrong when God gives you a specific area to minister. I've always said that Jesus and John operated around the same time, but they didn't do the same thing. You know, uh, uh, Paul was even confident to say that, I thank God I never baptized any of you. Because you guys in this church these days, you are like, I, I, I am a follower of Paul. I'm a follower of Peter. I'm a follower of this person. I thank God I didn't even baptize any of you. Because if I did, you guys would have been going around saying that I'm a follower of Paul. It means that Paul did not even uh, waste his time on baptism because that wasn't his call, just like Jesus. Jesus had to go to John the Baptist to be baptized. There were unique things he did in his ministry. Jesus uh, would not wash his hands before he would eat with his disciples. They didn't fast in his church. John the Baptist members washed their hands before they ate. They, they fasted. And Jesus' church members even questioned, how come we don't fast? And Jesus had to tell them that you don't fast whilst you're with a bridegroom. A time is going to come when you will fast when a bridegroom is taken away. And so there would always be uniqueness of your assignment your business, your call. And I'm just trying to make somebody comfortable. If God is giving you a business idea, that looks as if somebody has already done something similar to that which God is telling you to do. There is uniqueness in that which God is placing in your heart. So I want you to hang on as we go through this information because you're going to receive the information you need that makes your product or your service unique. And please draw my attention if you feel I'm going too fast. Uh, one other person described in Bible is a Proverbs 31 woman who is not mentioned by name. But this woman is a great businesswoman. She had the entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, she had a strong work ethic. In fact, Proverbs 31 verse 17 speaks to that. She makes and sells her own products. She makes sound investments according to 31 verse 16. And it's even able to make profits. All this while raising her children, her family, and running a home. She's certainly, I believe, an inspiration for aspiring women entrepreneurs today. 
a great woman of business. And so many of them, you, you think about Lydia, who provided space for the early church, a great woman who sold purple, the dye that was used to uh, dye fabrics in, the, in her days. It was a, bus a big business. She was right in a hub of, of that place, and she became a resource financially for the early church. <clears throat> and so uh, there is a reason why God will give us all these things uh, in the area of business. <clears throat> Excuse me, you look at somebody like Paul. Paul was a lawyer to start with. God calls him, he becomes an apostle, a great man who plants churches. But even in the midst of all that, we see that Paul uh, plants churches. He takes time off to enter into business, build and sell tents as a way of making income. And so there is nothing wrong, Pastor, if... Uh, church is not at a place where it can take care of you and your family to do some kind of business on the side. And sometimes it's not because church is not taking care of you, but God gives you something in your heart that you are supposed to project out there on a marketplace to create wealth for the kingdom. I think about Paul, the many churches he planted. Uh, today you go to Greece, uh, there are 93% who are Christians and 2% are Muslims. Paul planted, he began to plant many churches on his missionary journey in the place we call Greece today. You go to Cyprus, it's not different. His churches that he planted have grown. It is thriving. It is surviving. Many churches have come out of it. 73 Christians have uh, survived. 73% of the nation today are Christians. There are still Muslims up to 27%. But I think about Syria. He did a bunch of work there. But today, a lot of the churches are not doing well. We only have 16% of the nation as Christians and 70% as Muslims. You go to Turkey, the story is even worse. Paul did a lot of planting. In fact, he planted up to 14 churches in where we call present-day Turkey. And you ask yourself, where are all those churches today? They are gone. They've become mosques. They've turned into Muslims. And today, you go to Turkey, 99.8% of the nation are Muslims. This reminds me of one thing. Paul said, I became all things to all men that I may win some. The book of Ecclesiastes chapter 11 says something powerful. It says, cast your bread upon the waters and you will find it after many days. Bible says you cannot tell what will become of the seed. Just cast the seed. Some will do good. Some will do well. Some may not survive. But your place is to invest, cast the seed. And so there are places God is going to put in your heart to sow. You want to make sure you are sowing because he is the Lord of the harvest. Praise God. All right. With that said, I want to talk about the ultimate model. Jesus said in the book of Luke 2, 49, I said this before. He said, my business is the father's business. And he begins to unfold that. And I said last week, he started his business over 2,000 years ago, and that business is still growing. That business, I tell you, is more powerful than the business of Paul. His business is today, is today breaking forth, is breaking through, is breaking boundaries. Churches are being established all over the place. Jesus began it, is the foundation, is the CEO. In case you don't know, Bible says he's still the CEO. Bible says he's the head and we are the body. The head is the CEO. And that business is thriving. That is why the model of Jesus must become our model. And so today, I'm going to go right into what we have today, and hopefully we are able to cover um, the material for week two. All right. I want to start off by talking about business model and business strategy, because sometimes when you talk about business model and business strategy, people think the two are the same. But business model is not business strategy. Business model is all about how your business is generating income. Can I say that again? How your business is generating income. How are you doing it? That is called business models. There are so many different ways of generating income 
with what you are doing. So business model is all about how you are creating value and how you are being compensated for that value you are creating. God made you valuable. He placed value in you. And as you create that value, there is compensation that must come your way. Now, business strategy, on the other hand, is all about how you are planning to bring your business to the marketplace and how you are executing on it. I hope somebody understands that so far, the distinction between the two. With that said, I want to say also that business can never start without an idea. Business always starts with an idea. Now, can you take a minute and think through it? Do you have an idea? I tell you, whether you have one or not, there's been a time in your life where ideas have run through your mind and you're like, no, I think somebody already did that. Now, I, I don't think I have what it takes to do that. I want you to hang on because we're going to drill down. We're going to get some information that will make you reanalyze all the ideas that have been running through your mind. About eight years ago, I was speaking to one of our church members and um, she had a husband sat down with me and said, hey, we have this idea that we have gone so far to even uh, get the trademark for it. And I said, what is this idea? And they began to share with me this powerful idea that could be placed in cars that as you are driving, it is melting snow on the road. And I said, what? <laughs> this is an idea that must go into every car in every country that has snow. As you are driving, it is melting, snowing away, and they already have the trademark and they're sitting on it. And you'll be amazed the kind of ideas that is running through your mind that you think, well, I'm 60 years. How long am I going to be around to deal with this? You don't understand. I spoke about Kenel Sanders uh, last week who created KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken. He only began to do it when he retired in his 60s and he realized his pension wasn't enough to take care of him for the rest of the life. And that was when he remembered his mother's recipe for chicken and began dealing with it. And look at where we are today with KFC. It's almost everywhere on the globe. So business always starts with an idea. An idea is simply a vision. It's simply a goal. It could be a plan. It could be a purpose or simply a potential solution to an active problem. But the question is, how much is that idea? So as we go along, the question to ask is that, are we ready to execute on this idea, the product? It could be service. So what is the product? Because that, service, that idea must be turned into a product. What is the product? This is a solution in the form of a product or service. It could be as simple as teaching the word or packaging an anointed oil for a mega church. Somebody said, you know what? Churches are becoming so big. We cannot have everybody walk to the altar to receive the communion elements. So we're going to put it in small portions so that everybody can have it. We can all have communion at the same time without taking three hours for people to come to the altar. Can we also have anointing services where this anointed oil is packaged into small containers so that during the anointing oil, the pastor doesn't have to dip his hand in an anointing oil and place on the forehead of people to have people falling down. Because people could fall down. If that is what we truly want to see happen, they will be slain in the spirit without touching them. Glory to God. We've had people in our virtual services have demons come out of them without they being in a building with us. So why not the anointing oil? So, so again, your product could be as simple as packaging olive oil in small containers and in portions that parishioners could have for anointing service. It looks like I just gave somebody an idea. 
that he or she may run with. <laughs> so your product could be as simple as, you know what, well, hey, Apostle, you know what, I've been hearing what you're doing, and you know what, I want to be your transcriber. I want to be a scribe. Anytime you are preaching, I want to transcribe word for word everything you are saying. And you know what? I'm going to create contents out of it. And you know what? By the time you are done, everything you said has been converted into a book. Oh, that's a niche right there. Because there are so many pastors that are looking to write books. And all you need to do possibly is to put a product in place that guides pastors. Pastor, you know what? You could do a seven-week series. Make sure that every series is a chapter that you are dealing with. By the time you are done, a book is out. Guide them. Put, put some kind of uh, idea together that guides pastors even in their preaching so that the contents of their preaching that you're getting ready to uh, uh, transcribe is already uh, in place in ways that makes it progressive for a book and its content. That is, if you believe that is what God is placing in your heart. So that is product. But then can you also think about marketing? Because it's not just having the idea. There must be some marketing. It simply means how are you getting the service or product in front of the right customers? Please understand that product might not be for everybody. So how do I get this product I'm thinking of in front of the right people? Now, please listen to this. It is believed that about 70% of shoppers make their decisions at the shelf. <laughs> so uh, think about it. Out of every 10 person that goes into a store, only three of them have a list of things they are going into the store to buy. Seven out of the 10 of them are going to decide when they get in front of the shelf and something catches them. How many times haven't you said or heard people say when the sales attendant asks, how may I help you? And their answer is, well, if something catches me, I will let you know. 70% <laughs> of people going into stores are making decisions when they get to the shelf. That right there tells me that the positioning of shelf is crucial. How you position the shelf how things are placed on the shelf has an impact on the customer walking through the doors of your business. So you just can't dump things anyhow on the shelf and pray over it and say, Father, I command customers to come in. And as they come in, uh, let the oil of attraction. <laughs> we have craziness going on these days where uh, pastors tell church members, this oil here is called oil of favor. This one is oil of attraction. Pour it on your products and people walking in are going to be attracted to your products. I tell you what, there is something we're missing out. Bible says, my people perish because of lack of knowledge. And at the same time, Bible says, in the last days, knowledge shall abound. He didn't say oil shall abound. A lot more oil on the pulpit than knowledge from the word of God. And no wonder we are frustrated economically. Now, it is also believed that 70% of shoppers are turning to buyers based off simply on the positioning of shelves. 70% of people that are, oh, I'm just looking. I'm just shopping around. They instantly become buyers. They rapidly progress from looking, shopping into buyers just because of the positioning of the products. It is taking buyers, think about this for a minute, people that are walking into the store, it's taking them three to five seconds to make a choice at the shelf. So your product is on that same shelf with this product and their product, and you are competing because they are looking for ginger. There are 20 different types of gingers on that shelf. The customer coming to that shelf has three to five seconds to make a decision, which of these gingers am I going to take? That right there means that the colors I use, the labeling I use, the packaging, the bottle, the jar, whatever I'm using to package, whether it's a sachet 
all these things count because there are people that are attracted to color. There are people that are attracted to bottles. There are people that are attracted to a certain type of packaging. And so I cannot underestimate that. Listen, when Queen Sheba came to Solomon's palace, what got his attention was not the anointing and the presence that came on Solomon on the day he dedicated the temple when the priest could not stand to minister, when nobody could stand to None of those anointed impacted that woman. Bible says what impacted the woman was the shelves, the way his men were packaged on the shelves, the way food was served, the way food was presented on the table. Bible says it impacted this woman, her spirit left her. Have you ever bought stuff and you took home and you asked yourself, why did I even buy this? Oh, many times. I've done that. Because there is something about a shelf that got you. I tell you, there are ladies that have bought shoes that were not even their size. We've bought clothes that are not our size because there is something about the shelf. Now get this, if you are thinking of ministry and you think that ministry or church is totally different from regular business, church shoppers or the unchurched, those who have never gone to church, those who don't go to church or those who are looking for a new church. Their reason is because I don't like the music. They don't play my kind of music. The other second reason why is, you know what? I'm being stabbed. I'm not being well fed. You'll be amazed the reason why people are church shopping. But this is what is interesting. Church shoppers are making decisions within 10 minutes on arriving at a church. It means their decision, oh, I think I like this church. I want to stay in this church. They make that decision within the first 10 minutes they get into your church. So you are doing an amazing, beautiful thing in your community by getting vegetables and bringing to the community. That's amazing. But if all those vegetables are somewhere around the entrance of your church and all these people coming in are smelling is onions, fresh vegetables, fresh fish, and it's disgusting at the entrance. And this person has no spirit in them. And all they are judging you because men look at you the outward, but it's only God that looks at the spiritual things in the church. Those men coming in are going to judge by the dirt and the stench at the entrance. So you can't underrate that. And say, so we are so powerful. The anointing is here. You're going to get slain at the entrance. Demons are going to be broken off your back and right at the front of your church. You don't even have a good sign to say you have a church. Your building is not painted. And sometimes all it takes is a $100 uh, fresh coat of paint. Uh, some of you have seats on your pulpit that looks, I mean, the seats the pastor sits on, they look like judgment seats. And people walking in, they get scared whether they are about to be judged. Glory to God. And so all these things are crucial. We cannot underrate them if you're a pastor, you're a minister. You got to pay attention to it. Hallelujah. So church shoppers, please understand 10 minutes. They make a decision whether I want to be here or not. That is why your greeters must be well-trained. That is why your ushers must be polite and filled with a spirit of hospitality. It's a gift. You don't want to put people there who do not have the gift of hospitality. It's one of the fruits of the spirit. So pastor, do the extra work. I want to have people at the front that represents the kingdom of God in our ministry who are gifted by the Holy Spirit with a gift of hospitality. People that can still put on their smile even when they've been through a challenging week so that they have a welcoming smile for the people walking through the doors. And of course, who do we want to attract? What kind of music do we want to play? You're still playing Ghanaian music and you expect to have Americans in your church. You still play Ghanaian music and you expect to have Jamaicans who are like, what are they talking about? I had to tell my church members that on Sundays, cut back on tongue speaking. I speak in tongues. 
But Paul lays it out clearly in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. He says, I will rather speak English than speak in tongues when I'm dealing with you who don't have a clue of what tongue speaking is. Read the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. He says, for he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, unto men. And you have men in your church. What business do you have speaking to them in tongues? <laughs> and for 30 minutes, Kaye, Kaye, Kaye. And people are like, they are zoned off. They are not involved in a church. And what is going on? And you're like, no, I don't want that church. I think they're crazy. What was that thing they were screaming? They don't understand. Paul said, if I came to you and I was speaking in tongues, I am a barbarian to you. So I will rather speak to you in the known. He says, I will rather sing in the known. But we got churches that will go crazy. Today, even on social media, people take to Facebook and they are blasting in tongues. Listen to me. Paul said, I will pray in tongues, but I will also pray in English. I will sing in tongues, but I will also sing in English or the known. He says, I thank God that I pray in tongues more than all of you. I wish somebody would take time to read 1 Corinthians chapter 14. This is Paul speaking. He says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. But when we come together, Listen, I would rather speak in the known language so I can communicate to you. In fact, he says in that chapter that if somebody has a prophecy, in fact, chapter 14, verse 1 says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. How be it in the spirit, he speaketh mystery, meaning tongue speaking is powerful. Verse 2, he says, He that prophesies edifies the church. So prophecy is for us. Prophesy to us. But then he even says that when there are people in a church who are prophesying, don't have 10 people prophesying at the same time. This one is screaming in one corner in tongues. That person is screaming. He calls it disorderliness. He says, let all things be done in order and in decency. And pastors are excited. People are falling down, screaming in tongues, doing crazy. No, I stop you in our church if you did that. You know why? Bible says that the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. It means the one that gives you the ability to prophesy also gives you the ability to control the gift. That is why sometimes you have the ability to prophesy. You can have palpitation. You, you feel like, I got to say this. And your heart begins to palpitate and you're afraid to say it. And you don't say, God, don't take a hammer and hit your head because he gave you a word and you fail to speak it. He gives you the ability to control the gift. So in that same chapter, Paul says something powerful. He says, let one person prophesy when he's done the second. He says, even in a church, don't do more than three. It's all in the scripture. And he says, if the person is speaking in tongues, there should be somebody in the church who also have the gift of interpretation, who must interpret. And then I love this. He says, if there is nobody in that church service to interpret the tongues that person is speaking, let that person shut up. <laughs> it's in the Bible. First Corinthians chapter 14. I didn't plan this. I don't know why God would want me to teach this. But listen, pastor, God wants you to bring order to the church. If you want to scale the ministry God has given you, God wants you to have order. I don't care if you have 1,000 people in your church. That doesn't mean anything. It's only human beings that judge your success by how many people you draw into a room. God says on that day, I will look at you and say, get out of here. Get out. Get out. I don't know you. Because you walk in disorderliness and disobeyed me. I was in none of the things you did. So again, we must approach ministry, church, whatever God has called us to, with a business mindset. Wow, time just went by. But praise God, praise God. We got to get something in. Um, is somebody still getting it? <laughs> All right. So the next thing is that how are you executing on it? Talking about the idea. Are you thinking about expenses? Because every business will come with an expense. I'm talking about a cost of production. And pricing must meet the budget of your potential customer. Don't go crazy. I don't care how much it's going to cost me. They're going to buy it. No. 
you know the people you want to bring this product to. The question you're going to ask yourself is that, would they be affordable? Would the product be affordable for the kind of people I'm bringing this product to? So decision has to be made, for example, if product or service is going to be subscription basis, is this something you are doing that will require subscription or a one-time purchase, or even if it's something that people can franchise? All these things have to be looked into whilst we are thinking through of the idea the Lord is placing our heart. Well, next steps we got to be taking when we have great ideas. When you have those light bulb moments, you know, uh, as I'm talking right now, I believe some you're having some light bulb moments. Perhaps one idea that came into your mind that you just can't get off your head and you feel super excited about. That is a great idea. It may be the time to take the key steps to validate your idea. So the question is, what do I do next? And we're going to talk about that. I have just about six minutes, but let's see. How are you executing on it? I'm talking about how is your public image and internal DNA going to look like? Uh, public or corporate image is as important as the internal culture of the organization you are building. Let's see the model of uh, a few successful business executives. Uh, and of course, I will, I will talk about Jesus, uh, who I spoke about earlier on. And like I said, everyone here listening to me is somehow connected directly or indirectly in some form or shape to the business model of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus... Uh, corporate model, uh, he asked two questions. Uh, who do men say I am? He was trying to figure out how the corporate image out there looks like. And then, of course, he says, who? You guys who are right here with me, who do you say I am? He was also concerned about the internal image. And we see that in the book of uh, Matthew 16, verse 13 through 15. Now, how are you going to execute your idea without a research? A lot of people don't realize how many companies will put thousands and thousands of dollars. And sometimes in big corporates, uh, they will put millions of dollars into R&D, research and development, because it is so crucial for the future of the organization. So, of course, if that is what you are thinking of doing, you have a great idea, you could go to great websites like Crunchbase. And I know after today, you better write this down, Crunchbase. Some of you will go there, and the first thing that would deter you is the money you have to pay to gain access on Crunchbase. But Crunchbase has so many segments. They have so many information that will guide you and give you ideas of people that are already in the space you are trying to get into. And so why not? Why not? Why not look at who is doing what you are trying to do? And uh, one thing we know, and I love this about uh, Mark Cuban, who is one of my favorite Shark Tank personal personality. He says, what you are thinking of, possibly 100 other people have thought of your idea. And so it's good to find out who is doing the same thing directly or indirectly, who may have done it even in the past, who might have failed and why did they fail? And this is all the information, Google and Crunchbase and all these places doing your research will tell you. You want to find out who has made it and succeeded and what made them successful. You want to find out that. What are the different churches that have been in this area? God wants me to pitch my church. Why are all the uh, uh, Orthodox churches here filled with only a handful of old people and uh, the youth are not going in? It's research and development. You got to find out. Jesus said, what are they saying about our ministry out there? And what do you think about our ministry here? And so, Pastor, you can just not pray and not find out what is going on in the community. Again, what are you willing to sacrifice? Because that idea is not coming into fruition until the cost is paid. Your sacrifice may include some family time. It may cost you five to 10 years of your life just developing this concept. It took Jesus three years of his life to develop his business model. It may cost you some sleep. It may cost you some competing ideas because some of you have thousands of ideas. You need to shed some of them. 
to focus on this one great idea God is even putting light upon, shining his light upon. Think about it. Jesus' family did not support him. He even said a prophet is without Anna in his own town. One time his family came to him and said, they said, your family is here. He said, where's my family? They are not part of my ministry. These folks right here with me are my family. Look at what Jesus says for us to really think about opportunity cost. When we talk about opportunity cost, it is a foregone alternative. You cannot have what you want until you are willing to sacrifice something that competes for time and resource for what you want to do. This is how Jesus puts it in the book of Matthew 13, verse 45, verse 46. I'll tell you what, Jesus speaks finance more than any other thing. And Bible speaks finance more than any other thing. Jesus puts it this, this way in verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one, not two, one pearl of great price or great value, he went and sold all that he had and he placed all his wealth into this one thing. Talking about focus, being laser focused on that one thing that God is highlighted in your heart. And then I love verse 47. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and they sat and gathered the good into vessels, but they threw the bad away. They caught shrimps. They caught lobsters. They caught uh, sea bars. They caught uh, red snapper. They caught barracuda fish. They caught all kinds of things. But the Bible says they threw everything away except the bronzini, because they went out there and their goal was to catch only bronzini fish. What are you out there catching? What is your idea? You got to let go of any other thing that is competing for the idea God is giving you. Pastor, you don't have to be like all the pastors. You are being bipolar on the pulpit. Today, you see a pastor preaching a setting where you want to preach like him. You see a pastor do something with oil, you, you want to do some. You see a pastor asking for something, you want to do the same thing. You are being bipolar. Stay with what God has called you to and stay true to it. Jesus could have also gone to Jordan and baptized people because he was the son of God. But even when he needed to be baptized, he went to the man who had the ministry of baptism because he understood that the gifts of God is not completely in one person. God gives us a portion as he wills. And so what is your portion? Please understand one thing. That sacrifice will be indispensable to bring your idea into fruition. You can't achieve anything in life without a small amount of sacrifice. And that is what Shakira says. If you don't sacrifice for what you want, what you want will become the sacrifice. Think about that for a minute. If you don't sacrifice for what you want, what you want becomes the sacrifice. I love Tom Schaaf. He's a CEO of uh, Crime Check. He moved out of his home with his wife and rented it out and went to stay in the basement of his in-laws. They lived off of approximately 10% of their income. Why did they do that? They chose to live simply whilst building assets and wealth. They allowed time to compound their wealth. So instead of living in that beautiful home, they rented it out and made income and also cut back on their income by living in the basement of their in-laws, the father, the man's in-law, just so he can gather enough to invest in the idea that he had. But look at crime check today. It's because he sacrifices comfort. He sacrificed something so he can have his dream fulfilled. Think about Grant Cardone. He's not one of the people I really like because he's too brash. He's too arrogant for me, my personality. I don't do too well with people like that. And not because there is anything wrong with that personality, but I personally don't gravitate towards him too much because I feel he's too aggressive and what have you. But a man, give it to him. He's a successful man. Grant Cardone, he's actually having a program coming up with T.D. Jakes and a lot of great people. This guy has become a top sales expert who has built a 500 million real estate empire. And he's a New York Times bestselling author 
of what is called the obsessed or the average. Now think about this. Before 2008, he was playing golf three times a week. But this is what he decided to do. I'm going to sacrifice my love and passion for playing golf. And when I read this about him, I was like, what is so special about playing golf? And I realized that if you wanted to play 18-hole golf and you were just about four friends playing, that game is going to take you four hours. It could be more. The only way you would do four hours is because all of you are looking out for friends. If your ball went that way, uh, the friend that wasn't playing yet will run and pick the ball. If you were helping each other, you spent four hours just playing golf. And he did that three times a week, talking about 12 times. He says, I'm going to sacrifice it. And you know, it's expensive. A lot of investment goes into buying club, the caddy, and all the things that goes with golf. He gave it all out. And he says, because I have an idea and I want to develop it. And so I'm going to let go of this fun and sacrifice. And it's called the cost of success. And today he's built an empire of $500 million of real estate. How big could this idea you have be? And I'm going to finish on this. Time didn't allow me to finish everything. But how big could this idea? Because some of us don't see how big it is. Some of us can't see the tree inside that little seed. You see that little seed, that idea has many trees in it. And some of us can't see that. Look at what the Bible says in the book of Matthew 19, 27 through 30. Then Peter said to him, we've given up everything to follow you, meaning we've sacrificed. What will we get? Jesus replied, I assure you that when the world is made new and the Son of Man sits upon his glorious throne, you will have been my followers. You who have been my followers will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel and everyone who has given up houses. Look at that opportunity because everyone that has given up houses, brothers, sisters, father, mother, or children or property for my sake will receive a hundred times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. But everyone who are, but many who are the greatest now will be least important then. And those who seem least important now will be great. It means when you sacrifice, you'll seem to look least. But a time comes when you become great because of the sacrifices you are willing to make now. How big could this be? This will determine the future of the business. So you want to make sure the market is big enough to justify all the amount of time and resources going into the idea over time. Next week, I'm going to take it from here and talk about some finances of your ideas, how much money goes into it, and all the beautiful things that comes with a family. I truly enjoy, as always,